Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live on TV3 with me, Martin Isidu Dutta. This bulletin is coming to you live from our studio here at Adesanwe in Accra. Coming up within the next one hour. State begins efforts to recover monies in excess of 12 billion uh, CDs spent during the banking sector cleanup. Kwame Nkrumah Circle GPRTU members prevail over a group of military and macho men who invaded the station. As the world celebrates World Mental Health Day today, families have been encouraged to be on the lookout for suicidal tendencies in depressed relatives. And... Um, Nigerian Senate introduces bill aimed at preventing sexual harassment at university, on university students. We have details of all these stories and more, including business, sports and entertainment coming up in the next one hour. Let's start from the courts now. Nine out of 11 persons accused of plotting to overthrow the government have been charged with treason. No charges were, however, preferred against Lance Corporal Albert Baba Ibrahim and Lance Corporal Godwin Ni Ankra. The, those charged with uh, the, are the medical director, the director of Citadel Hospital, Dr. Frederick Yao Macpalm, Donya Kafui, alias Ezo, uh, a blacksmith, Bright Alan Debra Ofusu, a freight manager, Kenel Samuel Kojo Gameli, Gershon Akpa, a civilian employee of the armed forces, uh, Warrant Officer Class 2, Esther San, Lance Corporal Ali Solomon, Lance uh, Corporal Seidu Abubakar, and Sylvester Akambari. The prosecutor, Assistant Superintendent of Police, Sylvester Asari, withdrew the three previous charges, uh, charge sheet and presented a new one. The nine accused persons are before the court for remand until committal proceedings, which will determine whether the case should be tried at the High Court, um, when the high, uh, where it commences at the High Court. Presenting the facts, ASP Asari told the court that the nine persons were part of a group known as the Take Action Ghana, TAG, which was founded by Dr. McPowell. The group last, uh, he said, planned to organize a series of demonstrations, topple the government and destabilize the country. The prosecutor said, based on intelligence, security operatives on September 23 this year arrested the members. Per the new remand uh, order, the civilians are to be placed in police custody while the soldiers are to be placed in military custody. Hearing continues on October 28. Let's go to the phone lines now and speak to uh, Edmund Foley. He's a former law lecturer. He's a lawyer himself. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon to you and good afternoon to your listeners. Right. To start and with, US. if uh, uh, the, the, the treason charge seems to be very serious. Now, if we are to charge someone with treason under the Ghanaian law, how serious is it? Thank you very much. Treason, as you have rightly said, is a very, very serious um, offense. Um, treason, in a nutshell, and to, for the layman's terms, is to attempt to or to overthrow the lawful authority of the state. So if you were to rise up against the lawful authority of the state, and by that, essentially, let's say the government of the, of the state, and you were to do so by force of arms, or by any other means of violence, that would amount to treason. And in Ghanaian law, it carries the death penalty if you are uh, charged with treason. So serious is it that if you commit an act of treason, you are charged. The Constitution even and the Criminal Procedure uh, Code of Ghana requires that the trial will be conducted by three judges of the High Court. So it is treated with utmost seriousness mm. as far as uh, the laws of Ghana are concerned because it would invariably amount to you trying to 
overthrow the decision that majority of Ghanaians may have taken, that a particular person or group of persons be in government to oversee all our affairs. So that's in a nutshell what it entails. And the individuals who have been charged uh, have had their photos. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you were saying the individuals who have been yeah, charged. Yeah, the, 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 the individuals who have been charged have had their photos widely circulated in the media. Should some of them at least uh, emerge innocent, are there, um, you know, uh, restitution processes that they can fall on to at least clear their name? Right. And now, with any criminal offence, generally with any criminal offence, even the slightest of offences or the least of offences, um, if you go through the criminal process as a suspect, um, you go through trial, you come out uh, innocent in that you are acquitted and discharged. If your photo has been in the media or even coming home, what is common to more people, the identification parade. You may even go through an identification parade. Mm. Unfortunately, we don't have any remedial measures. You may just get a, a, we are very sorry that this happened to you. The only possibility for a remedy is where we would have to consider a situation where somebody engineered the prosecution out of malice. Somebody out of ill will or malice started this whole process of reporting you, getting you prosecuted, and you coming out clean. Hmm. Then you can sue the person for what we call malicious prosecution. Okay. But otherwise, if you are a suspect, you go through the process, you pleaded your innocence, your pictures are all over, you have lost uh, your reputation and all of that. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the criminal process. Hmm. When you come out, yes, unless you can show that what was done to you was done out of malice, um, too bad, you only get a uh, sorry and then you move on. And, and in this case, we also do know that um, at least some weapons were allegedly found in their possession in their home or, or, or a yes. particular place. Yeah. With these yes. kinds of weapons and the, the quote-unquote intent to commit um, you know, such an, an atrocity on the state, how do you prove yes. that they intended to? So is there anything like intention to, and can that be proven in court? Yes, we do have uh, a certain level of intention to commit a criminal offense, which for the lawyers would call an inchoate offense, sort of an offense that is not finished. Okay. In fact, the law generally, as a matter of legal policy and philosophy, uh, the criminal law of a country would seek to punish you for trying to do something. We would not wait for you to finish. So mm. it is sort of intervening before the greater harm is caused. Yeah. So an attempt to commit treason, uh, if you have gone to procure weapons or any other means to overthrow the republic and you are found out, you can be punished for that attempt. Right. The critical element for the police or those who are doing the investigations at any point in time is when they strike, as it were, to determine at what point can we come in and say that the person is attempting. That is often an, uh, a prosecutorial and investigation decision to make. So you see um, in a typical Hollywood-style movie, mm. uh, they wait, wait, wait to see whether he or she is going to shoot before the SWAT team jumps in and stops the person, yes. So it's a question of how, where do we balance? But mm. definitely your inability to complete your criminal offense would still amount to an attempt procuring things to commit an offense that would involve causing harm to people. Mm. In fact, there is a provision in the Criminal Offenses Act, Section 19, called preparation. Okay. So preparing to commit a criminal offense is in itself also an offense where you procure material. Mm. So if any of this is proven, yes, an attempt to overthrow the state would amount to an attempt, attempt. to commit treason. And my final question, looking at the gravity of the charge, treason, what kind of defense yes. can these persons mount? Well, if they are able to show that, well, they, whatever weapons they are said to have acquired were acquired lawfully, not only that, but were acquired not to be used for that purpose, mm. 
then yes, the charge would fall. They could also just sit back and wait to see whether the prosecution will prove its case against them. The slightest, you see, that the, the standard in criminal law is very high, that you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. So right. if they're able to raise the slightest doubt as to the veracity of the charge or the evidence being put against them, um, they are likely to be acquitted uh, okay. by the judge. Or in this case, it will be the judges who sit on the, on the case. So they could also as well sit back and see how things roll. If the prosecution is not able to establish a case against them, they would, uh, of course, get their freedom. Mm. All right. Thank you very much for the education you've given us this afternoon. Edmund Foley is a former law lecturer at Gimpa. So if you're just joining us, the news is that the persons who were arrested uh, somewhere in September, the latter part of September, around 20th to 23, 23rd September, have been charged with treason. And um, that is the latest news coming from the courts. We'll keep an eye on it and see how it unfolds in the coming days. Meanwhile, the civilians are being treated differently from the military men who were also picked up as accomplices to this coup plot. Stay with TV3. Details of that story will be coming in our subsequent bulletins. Away from that, though, our families have been encouraged to be on the lookout for suicidal tendencies in depressed relatives. Psychiatric, psychiatrist Dr. John Paul Amujin of Freethink um, uh, Health Consultant uh, says that suicide is on the increase among the youth, hence the need to concentrate efforts on halting the trend as well so the world celebrates world mental health day is commemorating it today beatrice spielgabra interacted with a psychiatrist and a teacher who attempted suicide on two occasions why do you think um, this world health organization that is looking at suicide prevention well i think it's a very 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 important topic um every year who selects pressing issues to focus on for the year and as of now suicide is the second leading cause of death in people aged uh, 15 to 29 years old and this is a very large chunk of our workforce so it's very 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 important that it's addressed also in men under 50 years old it's worldwide one of the leading causes of death so it's very very important to talk about this you are a teacher and a businessman. Listening to Doc, at what age did you try to commit suicide? Um, if I should remember, well, that was um, 28 years of my age. Yeah, the first one I tried hanging myself with a rope, um, with um, a sponge in my room. Um, um, what was wrong with you that you tried to hang yourself in the first instance? Basically. That was hardship, looking for a job, no job for you. The amount you are earning is so small compared to your responsibilities. So that was it. But And then the second incident, what happened? And how did you try to suicide or end your life? Yeah, That was um, jail train. Jail train is normal for me now. But it wasn't normal for me. I took it so personal. I took it as someone who is virtually failing everything. So because if, if you can't keep a woman, then you can't keep everything. So your girlfriend left you for another person and you thought it was the end of the world for you? Not completely, but should I use cheating? Okay. It's like playing the two of us. Uh, so that made me feel so bad because so that, that, the thought that came to mind was you are very worthless. I went to school to teach. After teaching, I went to a place to get the DDT. I went home and was putting few stuff together because I knew that that day I'm going to execute my thought. So um, I took half of it. I took it. The last thing I can remember after that was very tasty. And uh, so I was looking for one to drink and realizing after taking it, I will give off. But then I had prepared a side note and wanted to hand over to uh, my junior brother. Uh, so I remember calling, but as to picking, I don't remember again. I, I only came conscious um, around 9.30, 9.30 thereabout at the hospital. Um, do you regret all these two attempts that you tried taking your life? Do you regret it now? For now, yes, I do. Because it, it, it's the worst for every man to do.
Suicide is not the option. Listen to him, it means that um, he had a problem, but he didn't know. So does it mean that anybody who tries to commit suicide or indeed succeeds in committing suicide has some form of mental issues? Yes, yeah, so 90% of people who attempt suicide have an underlying mental health problem. Most of the time it is depression. Let's all be watchful, look out for signals and triggers that will lead someone to commit suicide. Beatrice Pugabra, TV3 News, Kumasi. Let's stay on this subject matter a while longer because the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Mental Health Authority, Caroline Amisa, says mental health care in Ghana needs critical attention. She is hopeful that the passage of a draft policy on mental health care delivery before Cabinet will address challenges impeding the progress of mental health care in Ghana. 41% of the population, predominantly women, suffer mental distress and depression, which is likely to worsen considering the current outlook. Ghana's doctor-to-patient ratio in the mental health sector stands at 1 is to 1.7 million compared to 1 is to 1 million in Nigeria and 1 is to 50,000 in Kenya. The Mental Health Authority, together with the Bestel Child and Adult Psychiatric Foundation, signed a five-year memorandum of understanding to direct the delivery of mental health care in the country. The MOU is aimed at improving the lives of people with mental illness in Ghana, improve access to health care, reduce stigma, and reintegrate treated mentally ill persons into society, among others, as the objectives. A 50-acre land has been provided by the Asantiman for the construction of a recovery hospital to augment government efforts. There is a survey that says that one in four individuals in the West, in fact the UK, experience some sort of mental ill health. And in Ghana, I don't think we've got that data. I'm not sure how many. So obviously what Bristol is trying to do is to ensure that the entire community is aware of what mental health is and its challenges and what support is in place. Deputy CEO of the Mental Health Authority, Caroline Emisa, stressed the need to to stop chaining mentally ill persons at prayer camps, churches, herbal centers, among others, but refer patients to health facilities. We intend that all organizations should have a unit where persons can go to for what we call mental health first aid. So this is a place where people feel free to talk to persons who have been trained or professionals to be able to be taken through what their problem is and how to come up with a solution. So it should be a place where people are confident to go to, not a place where people feel intimidated or where their problems will be used against them. She wants the public to take mental health issues more serious and seek expert advice. So let us take care of one another. Mental health is a national concern and uh, you do not have to take your life. Suicide is not an option. Let's stay on uh, issues of other big stories we are following for you. Now, National Association of Law Students uh, have reiterated their call in getting the General Legal Council to reform the legal education to make it more accessible, uh, equitable and affordable to many students who qualify to pursue law. The National Association of Law Students wants Article 32 of the 1992 Constitution, which was enacted 60 years ago, to be repealed by Parliament to reflect the changing demand of legal education. SRC President for the National Association of Law Students, Jonathan Alua, made this call when he addressed the press um, today. President of the Association, Jonathan Alua, appealed to President Kufado to intervene by directing the Minister of Justice and Attorney General to present an amended bill to Parliament. The move, he insists, will enable a new direction and institutional framework in the country's legal education. The reforms we are calling for can only happen when the President causes the Attorney General and the Minister for Justice to present a bill to Parliament to either amend or repeal Act 32 to give a new direction and institutional framework for legal education in the country. They want the Attorney General to also direct the General Legal Council to withdraw the undertaking signed by students before writing the young trans examination. They also so, want the marking scheme to be published so that students can apply to have their script remarked 
Should there be any doubts? In the short term, we are calling for the president to intervene by directing the attorney general to order the general legal counsel to withdraw the illegal undertaking signed by students ahead of their taking the entrance examination. We are asking that marking scheme be published so that the students who were purported to have failed the exam can apply to have their scripts remarked if they believe that their scripts conform to the marking scheme. Reacting to brutality meted out to them by the police during their demonstration on Monday, October 7, Jonathan Alua said they will not bother seeking legal redress but want government to compensate them with the legal reforms they seek. The whole nation is shocked and surprised at the manner in which we were handled by the police. We will not be distracted. Our goal is to seek for legal reforms and we maintain that the only compensation we can get for being treated that way in our own country, the only compensation we can get is the legal reforms we seek. So that was a presser from yesterday. So Ghana has been announced as the honorary country for the 44th edition of the Memphis in May International Festival in 2020. The delegation of the Memphis in May International Festival announced Ghana's participation when it paid a courtesy call on the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Accra. According to the Memphis in May International Festival Board, Ghana was the golden country of West Africa with a stable democracy and a strong economy driven by tourism, mining and oil, protect, uh, oil production. The Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Shirley Ayoko Butri, expressed pleasure at the opportunity given to Ghana to display its rich art and culture and cuisine to the locals of Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis in May International Festival is a month-long festival held in Memphis, Tennessee in the United States. And it's a program aimed at promoting understanding between citizens of Memphis in the United States and the honored country. The mission of Memphis in May International Festival is to promote and celebrate Memphis culture, foster economic growth, and enhance international awareness through education. Ghana becomes the seventh African country to be honored. Uh, this is still Midday Live on TV3. Let's move on to some other stories actually started trending yesterday. So the former chief executive officer and managing director of defunct capital bank, William Atto Asian, has been sued over the collapse of the bank. He, together with three executives, Fitzgerald Odonko, Kate Kwate Papafio and Tetenete, have been hit uh, with 26 charges by the state. In a suit filed at an Accra High Court, the state accused Atoisian and Tetenete of conspiracy to steal contrary to sections 23 1 and 1241 of the Criminal Offences Act 1960, Act 29. From the writ, William Atoisian and Tetenete, between October and November 2015, agreed to act together with a common purpose to steal 100 million CDs. The Bank of Ghana on August uh, 27, sorry, on August 2017, revoked the license of Capital Bank due to its insolvency, leading to its takeover by the GCB Bank. Capital Bank was found uh, to be owing 468 million CDs, which was said to have been um, to have risen due to negligence from the board, and uh, that's an issue that uh, actually broke yesterday. We are following it keenly, and. We want to find out really what next now that this uh, lawsuit has been filed. Let's uh, come in. We've been joined by Joe Jackson. Um, clearly, he's uh, someone who's been following this particular story quite keenly, right from when the collapse of the banks started. And I want to pick his thoughts on this. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Uncle Joe, as we call him. Uh, the boldest reports was one of the reports that, um, you know, came out, it had its own criticism. But then the Central Bank of Ghana and the joint receivers of the defunct Capital Bank have all accused the board of directors of being responsible for the bank's collapse. Now, what could inform a strategy to go after just these four people out of the total number of persons that we are told uh, played a role in the collapse of some other banks? Well, good, good afternoon. Good right. to be here again. Um, first of all, we have to no. Accept that number one, the 
the, 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 the case is before court. And so whatever we say is without prejudice. Okay. And whatever we say has to be that we are raising a few issues and questions for thought. And we have to presume that these individuals are innocent unless proven otherwise. But moving on from that, if you read through the lines and you look at the particular charges that were set against these people, mm. uh, these individuals, and uh, there are about four of them, yeah. you see that this goes beyond what the, the, the board has been accused of. And the board has been accused of not uh, fulfilling its duty to, to keep uh, the financial management of, of their institution in order. Mm. This, the, 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 the charges levied are very serious. They say you conspired to steal. To steal. Not mismanaged. You conspired to steal. Mm. You conspired to defraud. And so this is, goes beyond the general board. And I, and, and I know that, on, especially on social media, there's been a lot of talk about why, why are the other board members not in... Um, right. Part of the suit. Part of the suit. Now, all I, I don't know the, the mind of the Attorney General, and so we can only conjecture that what is at stake is that these particular in, uh, individuals have been charged over and beyond their role as board members. How so? How so? Because uh, clearly the state has been able to establish that, yes, the bank was insolvent. Yes. Yes, the, the leadership of the bank, the managers, and the board played a role. So if you say we are unable to tell specifically how so? Okay, now let, let, me, let me go over this again. Mm. As a board, and let's say you and I are the, uh, sit on the board of an institution, as a board we can oversee uh, 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 reckless lending and make the institution insolvent because we couldn't collect the money back because we, 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 we misapplied the funds. That's a separate thing. Then, but this says that over and beyond that, you and I or the individuals here have been charged with conspiring and, and, and conspiring here, no other members. And you notice that it's very specific. Mm. It says individual X yeah. and individual Y conspire to uh, uh, steal 70. Then individual X and individual Z conspired to sell uh, 5 million and 100 million and the figures go on and on and on. And it's very specific. So here, if, if any other board member was not mentioned, we have to presume that this particular charge of theft cannot be levied or we're waiting to see. Mm. Mm. But this, these, these charges, it's money laundering. It's, 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 it's stealing. It's not... Uh, it's not that you just mismanaged affairs and you didn't play your fiduciary, you didn't uh, play that role well, or, or the institution you managed so was reckless. this is clearly stealing. This is stealing. This is, this is, this is a very uh, um, specific charge. At Asian, I mean, it had been on the quiet, the, this whole banking sector cleanup had been on the quiet for some time until we heard Atu Asian speak. And he was also categorical and said that he did not. How could he conspire to steal his own, uh, to steal from his own bank? Uh, let's listen to him specifically as to what he said. Then would come in studio and ask about why would someone want to steal from his own self? Then maybe uh, as someone who is in the industry, you can help us understand whether the nuances in that. So let's watch that. So you didn't chop the money at Capital Bank? I never chop a dime, Paul. Paul, what is the point in your funds? What is it? It is my baby. That makes sense. It's your bank. It's my bank. I gave back to the bank. Well, but they say people set up a bank and rob it. Yeah, but how can you do that? If people do it, looking at where I have come from, mm. migrated it from an unregulated institution to a regulated space and now to a universal bank, why would I want to do that? Paul, mm. I'm I was also being insulted. And that was when I got amazed how narrative can be turned and twisted. I have sued. Oh, you have? I have. Oh, I see. I, I have didn't... sued the Bank of Ghana. But you're a Christian, you don't want to forgive? I have forgiven, but my property must be protected. 
Mm. My property must be protected under the Property Protection Act. Mm. We are property owning democracy. Mm -hmm. Hard work must be rewarded. If the bank was that bad, our current finance minister, Honorable Ken Oforiata, together with the chief executive of Enterprise Group, were in my office. Kelly Gadjeko. Kelly Gadjeko. To, to do say, what? We are interested to buy Capital Bank. No, no, hold on. Ken Oforiata, the finance minister. Yes. And Kelly Gadjeko, the, yes. the, his, his yes. partner at Data Bank yes. and Enterprise, yes. came to see you. Yes. This is when Ken was finance minister. No, before he became finance minister. Okay. That's right. They came to you yes. that they wanted to buy your bank. Buy the bank. If it was that stressful, would they have done so that? So this was here? This was 2016. All right. So, Mr. Jackson, is it justified to say how would he steal from himself? How would he steal from his own bank, his own baby? Well, first of all, Again, I'm reminding you that I cannot confirm yeah, or uh, no, no, no. Uh, that he stole from, but I can tell you a, that a set of circumstances can happen where you can be said to steal from your own bank. Now, let's... Is this something that happens in the industry? Well, it, I, I wouldn't say... It could ha it happen? could happen, yes. It could very easily happen. Mm -hmm. Now, let's assume that I set up an institution and I put up 5 million CDs as my share of the... Uh, of the uh, capital. And then, after the institution has grown and mobilized funds to the tune of, say, a hundred plus million, I go back mm. Mm, and take a hundred million out in a fraudulent manner or in a manner in which I could be said that I didn't even plan to pay or I, I reroute the company to another asset of mine, then you could say that I set up the institution mm. and then I took out, because remember that the institution receives uh, depositors funds. Right. And part of the institution also has you, the promoter, or the shareholders funds. Now, if you take out far more money than, first of all, your shareholders funds are not even supposed to be taken out. They're supposed to be there to cushion the institution in case something goes wrong. But if you take out the money of your shareholding, you then proceed to take out even more, and the amounts that we're talking about here far exceed the shareholders funds that were registered. Mm. Then, of course, we could be saying that you're stealing from, from yourself. yourself. So uh, even though uh, uh, the, the proverb says, if you cut your tongue and eat it, you haven't, eaten anything. you haven't eaten anything, this is slightly different because you are not cutting off your own tongue. You are cutting off the tongues of the shareholders who have placed money with you. Mm. And that's the slight uh, variation of the proverb that was quoted right. because if he had taken only his own funds it, it may not even strictly be right but we could have had a different discussion on this but there have been institutions in, in cases where people have taken shareholders funds mm. so with the shareholder but again i have to repeat that at this moment it's all speculation it's all conjecture. speculation and we're just we're just always saying that it can happen okay we're not saying that it happened in his case. Right. Let's, let's broaden the discussion beyond just uh, Capital Bank. Is this a signal of what is to come? Uh, uh, is this a, a step from government to tell everybody in that sector or industry that they will truly go after everybody who is, who is likely to have been culpable or complicit in the collapse of the banking sector? But they must. There's no doubt about it that they must. Mm. Listen, we've had estimates as high as $21 billion in a country where our budget was what, 54 billion last year, mm -hmm. right? How can we just allow 21 billion and say it's a cost to the, to, to the public purse? It's not, it's not just does the government signal, mm -hmm. the government has a duty to go over anybody who was fraudulently involved in this case. The mm -hmm. good thing is that it's going to court. Mm -hmm. And we say, listen, there's a lot of public interest Huge amounts of public interest. Sure. We're praying that this will be an open case, mm. that we can all go in and listen to this and, 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 and learn, lessons, and learn as well. lessons from it. Listen, this has potential to become a blockbuster uh, 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 case mm. and even to set precedents. 
right. for the financial sector. Okay. I think it's 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 it's. it's huge. I, I'll be following this case, mm. and there's going to be huge public interest in this case Certainly. because listen, the cost to us is too big. Yeah to the state. That's true. And uh, we would certainly follow it just like uh, Joe Jackson has said. We would also uh, follow this particular issue to the very letter and uh, see what comes out of it and the lessons that we can learn from it. But thank you very much, uh, Joe Jackson. He's the Chief Operations Officer of Dalex Finance. And uh, clearly this is not going to be ending anytime soon. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you. This is still Midday Live on TV3. We take a quick breather. When we return, we'll be letting you know what's happening, um, you know, with some other stories having to do with the president who has traveled to the Ashanti region. Stay with us. Thank you very much for staying with us. This is Midday Live on TV3. To some other stories now, members of the Ghana Road Transport Union, GPRTU, operating from the Obra spot at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle, have clashed with a group of military personnel and macho men. The group were there to evict them to pave way for the infrastructural development of the area. Here is a report by Peter Kwao Adato. This was the situation at the lorry station close to the Obra Sports at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle at about 8 Thursday morning. The Ghana National Fire Service were on hand to douse the burning ties at the exits of the station. The drivers and the conductors were all over the place chanting and daring those behind the plot. An excavator was at the entry point in an attempt to dig a trench for the construction of a fence wall, ostensibly to block access to the station. The angry group immediately masked up and ordered the operator to stop, but he declined. The youth then blocked the excavator with stones and locks amidst chants. <laughs> Some police personnel moved in to cordon off the area to prevent them from setting the excavator ablaze. Eventually, the youth managed to chase the military men out of the station. Our checks revealed that the military men came from the 48 engineers units of the Ghana Armed Forces and were acting on order from above. According to the drivers' union, the only time the attention was drawn to an eviction notice was Tuesday, October 8, after which they saw tipper tracks of stone chippings and sand meant for the construction the following day. They brought excavator and all this thing to start work. So our children were protesting. Then they gather uh, some old, old ties and burn them. When the smoke was going high, it alerted the public. So the police came in, the fire service, immigration. The GPRTU chairman further responded to claims that former Black Stars captain Asamoah was behind the project. Oh, it is only flying in the air. The, the land was sold to Asamoah by which we think it is an allegation. But it is yet to be proved that really Asamojani is the rightful owner of so and so. The Accra Regional Police Commander, DCOP Fred Edu Enim, and his team arrived later to assess the situation. We are all here to inquire from the drivers and their leaders about what happened. And uh, my information is that some soldiers came in this morning, early this dawn, with an excavator to come and construct a wall that's depriving those people who are occupying the land so far. We haven't seen those who are claiming ownership of the land. So we are still making inquiries to locate them and uh, also ask them questions. If somebody is claiming ownership of the land, that is the issue that we have to investigate and find out whether judgment has been given in favor of a party or somebody else. So, so far, those who are here as drivers and uh, union members, they are still here. They have no place to go until maybe an authority or an order directs that they, they leave this place. At the moment, calm has been restored and the various drivers have resumed work.
Other news this afternoon, the president of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Dr. Joseph Obeng, has chastised the ECOWAS Commission for what he describes as bias in favor of Nigerian, Nigeria following the closure of Nigeria's trade borders to Benin and other neighboring countries. Describing the development as an outright breach of ECOWAS treaties, he called on the commission to act swiftly as Ghanaian traders are bearing the brunt of the closure. George Queening reports. In August, Nigeria's President Muhammad Buhari ordered a partial closure of its border with Benin to check smuggling of cheap goods into the country. The Nigerian government insists there is no end in sight to the partial closure of land borders until smuggling is checked for the mutual benefit of all neighboring countries. President of the Ghana Union of Traders Associations, Guta, Dr. Joseph Obain, argued the issue, if not checked, could derail the African continental free trade area. The, uh, the foreign minister have um, disappointed us because who is talking for Ghanaians? Because um, they all came, uh, our, most of our uh, traders have got their capital locked, especially in this time that we have a, a seeming financial crisis where people's capitals are locked and then the few that they are trading has also locked there. And we don't have anybody to talk on our uh, in our favor. It's very wrong. He chastised the ECOWAS Commission for looking on without preferring any solution. We are very surprised that even as a nation and even member states have not even condemned this. ECOWAS Commission itself have not condemned this action, which is very, very, very bad. Um, Nigeria is protecting its sovereignty. All that it means is that um, Ghana has the right also to protect its sovereignty. When it comes to Ghana, when we want to enforce on our sovereign laws, ECOWAS descends on us and saying that um, for, for the purposes of integration, we should bend down on our efforts to enforce our laws, which is not a good right. Meanwhile, the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, GIPA, is to seek presidential intervention on the border closure. That's it for business on Midday Live. We'll be back with sports. Time for the sports now with me, Thierry Nyan. Now, former GFA Vice President uh, Fred Papo will launch his campaign and manifesto for the top FA job later today. Now, the event will be held at the Octagon at the Accra City Hall at 3 p.m. Fred Papo will disclose his visions and ambition for Ghana football at the launch as well as his means of achieving the goals. All right, so away from Fred Papo, let's do this man, another man who is hoping to be president of the Ghana Football Association, but that dream has been thrown into uh, the gutters uh, by the NC. Now, Wilfred Ose Kweku is set to drag the normalization committee of the GFA to the Court of Arbitration for Sports after his appeal over his disqualification was rejected by the interim governing body of football in Ghana. The uh, Tema Youth President is confident he will triumph and will be reinstated into the GFA presidential elections. His disqualification was based on a breach of GFA regulations, Article 33, 5C, but he denies any wrongdoing. Palmer is, however, committed to clear his name and get back in the running for president. The NC could be forced to postpone the elections from original date of October 25 if Palmer's appeal is held up by FIFA. Now, Ghana forward Rafael Jamina will undergo medical examinations at his club, Real Zaragoza, to find the cause of an uh, specified health challenge. Now, the club announced on Wednesday that the issue popped up during a routine health check done for the players at the club. The statement also said Zaragoza was confident that Jamina will soon recover and return to training. He has made nine appearances this season and has two goals to his name. All right, so that will end the sports here on Media Live. We'll return later at News 360, bringing you some more sports. But of course, now we've got some international news for you. Martin Asiri Dati, we'll see you through.
In international news this afternoon, the Nigerian Senate has introduced a bill that aims to prevent the sexual harassment of university students. The proposed legislation follows a BBC investigation that uncovered alleged sexual misconduct by lecturers in Nigeria and Ghana. The Senate's deputy president said he hoped the BBC's investigation would help energize support for the bill. If the bill were to become law, it would be illegal for lecturers to make any sexual advances towards students. And under the proposed law, which uh, was read in the Senate on Wednesday, teaching staff could face up to 14 years in jail for having sexual relations with their students. Um, the anti-sexual harassment bill was originally introduced in 2016, but didn't pass both houses of parliament. Time now for entertainment news. Well, let's stay with issues regarding sexuality and sex. So despite the fierce resistance that greeted the comprehensive sexuality education, actress Lydia Fawson backs its introduction in basic schools. The versatile actress is convinced proper or re properly orienting young children about their sexuality will prevent them from being exploited sexually. On uh, comprehensive sexual education, a lot of people have shut it down right from the onset. They thought that we don't need it now, but you said that our kids need it. We need to give them the right orientation. Why do you think we need to introduce them to it now? I understand people's concern, you know, um, as parents. I mean, there are some legitimate concerns in there. I'm, I'm questioning the kind of training the teachers have to teach these children, uh, the kind of things they'll be teaching them. I understand people's concern, but the important conversation has been reduced to something basic and that's the danger in there we don't talk to people about sex even as adults we don't talk about sex there's this culture of silence around sex and a lot of children are abused you know even adults are abused and we don't talk about it it's very dangerous so it's not about just saying oh go and teach children about sex definitely it's not it's much deeper than that my concern is how simplistic it has been, been reduced to something just sex. One is much deeper than that. Sexual hygiene, sexual reproductive health. How many of you even go to your gynecologist? Because growing up, that part of your body has been covered as something demonic almost. So you don't even talk about it. So even a lot of women don't go to their gynecologist and then years later they develop all these complications. So it's much deeper than sex. No, it was released in 2009. Now, Sparrow Productions movie, The Perfect Picture, kept many movie enthusiasts glued to their seats with the intriguing storyline and exciting plots. Ten years on, acclaimed filmmaker Shelley Frimpong Mansa is back with the remake of the iconic romantic comedy featuring some of the, uh, the, the continent's finest actors and actresses. The Perfect Picture, Ten Years On, is expected to hit the cinemas in December 2019. Ladies. Looks like we have it all, huh? And smile! Oh, Sparrow's production, now Sparrow Pictures, has for the last 12 years served movie lovers with intriguing and quality movies. One of such iconic movies to have won many hats is Perfect Picture. The romantic comedy told the story of three beautiful women pushing their 30s and making bold attempts to change their lives even when destiny played its joke on them. I need a man to make me pregnant. They have one. They're all over. They're married or broke. So what? Following the huge success of the film, multiple award-winning filmmaker Shelley from Pomanto has assembled the cast on the back of a new plot titled The Perfect Picture 10 Years Later. In The Perfect Picture 10 Years Later, the casts are back not only to excite movie lovers, the movie will also trigger conversations on childlessness, sexuality and a host of other pertinent issues. I want them to come and watch a beautiful uh, movie. I think Ken said that uh, we have handpicked our locations very, very carefully. We wanted to showcase Ghana from a totally different angle. I mean, we have done that a lot with our movies, but we've been able to 
discover new places and we want to show it to Ghanaians and to the rest of the world. The music, again, 10 years ago, we actually resurrected Amachi Dede and the others and we are looking forward to doing that again. Renowned actress Jackie Apia is excited to have been cast in a project that won her many laurels a decade ago. Also in the plots are many actors like Jocelyn Dumas, Kea Sem, Ajeti Anan, Gloria Safo and legendary Nollywood actor Richard Moffat Damijo. How does it feel to be part of this project, first of all? I feel very privileged. Um, I've never worked in Ghana before, so this is my first Ghanaian movie, as it were. And I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm glad that it stars all the major Ghanaian actors, you know, so I'm looking forward to it. We all know the history of Perfect Picture 1, and for us to come back to, you know, more or less um, rekindle that spirit again. It's, it's really exciting for me. And the fact that now it's, it's taking a rather global stage, if you will, and so for us to come together to do it for Africa, um, it's, it's, it's a blessing to be a part of this. Yeah. Spiral Pictures believes it can break the box office success it chalked 10 years ago with the original production with a captivating storyline that will not only bring back memories but great new enduring ones. The perfect picture 10 years later will hit cinemas in December 2019. Surprising that 10 years has gone just like that. I remember the first day I went to watch this movie. So, well, if you have something to do, do it now. That's it for the bulletin. You came your way from us to be here at the sound in Accra. My name is Martin. It's David Do have a good afternoon as always. Stay positive. Bye for now.